The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. Hell is a real place. Many in religion today don't even want to admit that they believe in hell. And of course, those outside of religion may not believe in hell either. I'm not really sure why, especially the people in religion don't believe in hell because the Bible talks about it. You know, if you were thinking about something that was unpleasant, just dismissing it because you don't like it doesn't make it any less true. Perhaps you or someone you know has been foreclosed on with their house. They were not able to make payments for whatever reason, and the bank foreclosed on their house. Well, I seriously doubt they would come back to their home and say, well, I don't really enjoy this foreclosure process. I don't really like the fact that the bank is going to take away our home, so I'm just not going to believe in it anymore. Well, not believing that your house is being foreclosed upon doesn't make it any less true. And the same goes with hell. Hell is an unpleasant thought. It's an unpleasant idea. And some people may choose to dismiss it because they don't like the idea. But whether or not we choose to dismiss it in our minds doesn't make it any less true. As we dive into our lesson today, we're going to look at the idea that the Bible lets us know that hell is a real place. We're also going to talk about what hell is going to be like and who will be there. And if we are able to at the end, we'll also try to answer a very commonly asked question that some people pose, why would a loving God send people to hell? Well, let's get started first of all with the idea of hell is a real place. In the Bible, we can read from Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 that Jesus describes hell as a reality. He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and I invite you, if you have your Bibles, open them up with us and let's see what the Word of God has to say about this important topic. But in verse 28 of Matthew 10 we read, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus lets us know there's more to come after this life. He says, you don't have to fear those that will kill the body. And of course, we've read through history about many people being persecuted and killed for their Christianity. Unfortunately, that's still going on even today. And Jesus says, it's not as important to fear those who would kill the body. But instead, he says, fear the one who could not only destroy the body, but also place your soul in hell a place of torment that would come after this life. And Jesus speaks about this as a reality. We also look in the Bible at the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul taught that hell was a real place as well. Let's read some of his words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 7. There he writes, To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Well, uh, an everlasting destruction, an eternal place of torment and punishment, that's hell. That's what we're talking about. And both Jesus and Paul describe these places as reality. Let's also turn to the book of Revelation and see what the Apostle John had to say about this place. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, he says this, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable 
and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, he lists all those that have sinned and rebelled against God. If they have not had their sins washed away, if they have not repented of those sins and taken care of them, then John describes they have their place in a lake of fire, a place of destruction, a place of eternal torment. And this is what we describe as hell. Now it's interesting that Jesus himself, the Apostle Paul, and John the Apostle, all uh, either God or inspired of God, seem to treat hell as if it were reality. I think that's very significant. Today, many people in the religious world may want to dismiss hell because they don't like the idea. Well, that doesn't make it any less true. How could you dismiss something that Jesus Christ himself and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John talked about and described as being a real potential place that we could go if we don't obey God? Well, we've already started to perhaps see a little bit of what hell is like. It is likened, as we just read in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, maybe we can look at that verse one more time, Revelation 20, 15, because there it says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We look before at Revelation 21, 8. Now we're looking at Revelation 20, and we get this idea of a lake of fire. You know, fire is not pleasant, at least not if you're in it. Uh, the idea is being thrown into a lake of fire. Fire might be nice and cozy if you're sitting on the couch and looking at the fire from a distance in the fireplace, but going into the fire is not a very uh, good concept at all. It's not a very pleasant thing at all. Hell is being described as this lake of fire into which people would be thrown. It is a place of unutterable and everlasting shame and contempt. Not only is it torment, but there will be shame there. Let's think about that for a moment. What is shame? Shame is when you realize you've done something wrong and you feel bad about it. Those that will go to hell may not necessarily feel bad about their actions now. They may feel good. They're, they're rebelling against God. They're breaking His commandments, but they're fulfilling their lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which, as we looked at before in the lesson on sin, that's how Satan tempts us in this world. So here we are in this world, perhaps so Satan is tempting us and saying, you know, fulfill all these fleshly desires, have sex with whoever you want, eat and take drugs and do whatever you want, uh, steal if that's something that you want, the lust of your eyes, take it if you want it, you know, beat up anybody or step on anybody to get to the top of the corporate ladder if that's what you want to fulfill your pride of life, and we may feel good about it. But then, when we stand before Christ and realize that all those things were not only wrong, but now we have to pay for them, we may feel that shame. The shame for what we've done. The shame for those that we've also misled to this horrible place. Because others follow our example or others are influenced by us. And not only that, but we would be there with all the other people who've done the exact same thing. So a place of unutterable and everlasting shame and contempt. Let's read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, those are two very different pictures, isn't it? The picture of rising out of the grave to everlasting life versus rising out of the grave to everlasting shame. You know, shame feels bad, but imagine it lasting forever. Feeling guilt and shame for some things that you've done and never being able to overcome it. Jesus describes uh, hell also as a place of just being hideous, a place of darkness. As we continue looking at the scriptures, let's read Matthew chapter 25. And verse 30, there we hear this description, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Well, God is often described as the God of light, the source of light. And in these New Testament times, light was something very, very important to people. Jesus was using an excellent illustration here by calling it outer darkness because in reality, the people of this day and age would not even go to bed at night without leaving some kind of lamp burning typically, some kind of light to, to you know, give them comfort. And yet Jesus describes those that are cast out into hell as being in outer darkness, away from the light, away from any comfort. Notice he also says there's going to be weeping. There's going to be sorrow. Is, uh, weeping and, and stress and frustration and sorrow all can cause weeping because those people will know they've done wrong, they're now being punished for it, and there's no rescue, there's no way out. And then there's also described as gnashing of teeth. Some, some may describe this as a grinding of the teeth. Imagine, you probably don't even have to imagine, there's probably been some times in your life you've been so frustrated and so upset that you ground your teeth. You would grind them and, and just, you know, maybe even lash out at other people. Uh, that's a horrible feeling, a feeling of helplessness to be that frustrated. And yet this is what kind of picture we get when Jesus describes hell, a horrible, horrible place. Let's also continue with Matthew chapter 22 and read verse 13. There it says, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once again, a similar picture. And notice it also said, Bind him hand and foot. Who would go into such a place willingly? They won't. They will be cast into it. They will be bound and, and forced to go there because it is now time to fulfill God's justice and God's laws that said, if you sin, there will be death. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And now, if we choose to live on this earth in a life of sin and rebelling against God and choose not to accept or even have God in our lives, then God grants our wish later and says, okay, now you don't have me in your life. And now it's time to face the consequences. Well, darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, a place that people will not want to go willingly, but it's not over yet. We still read more in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Let's read what hell is described as there. As we noticed earlier, uh, John gives us a list of the people who will be sent there. But at the latter part of the verse, we read, It's a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, a place of punishment, a place where there will be torment. Well, if that wasn't bad enough, let's imagine for a second that we are there. Not only is there weeping and frustration and grinding and gnashing of teeth and, and pain and torment from the fire, but now we also have the other people that are there. There will be apparently lots of people there in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads into destruction. And all those vile companions that you will have in hell are those people who lived in a, in a way here on earth. The way that we saw in Revelation 21 verse 8, we saw the list of all those people, the whoremongers, the adulterers, the liars, the thieves, the... Those, the murderers, all those people who have done those things and did not have their sins taken away through obeying God, those will be in hell. And that's who we would be with if we, do, if we end up going there. We would not only have the torture and the un, unpleasantness of all the environment of hell, but nevertheless, we would also be there with all the other people who lived such a wicked way here on this earth. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and read verses 9 and 10. This gives us a more description about those that will be in hell. Here Paul writes, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, no revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, if they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God and they live that way here on earth, what's going to be their destiny afterlife? 
those are the kinds of people that will be in hell. And if we don't live our life right and obey God and get our sins taken away through washing away uh, of our sins through the blood of Christ in baptism, then that's where we'll be as well. Or is that a place that we want to be? Is that the companionship that we desire after this life is over? Let's also read uh, Revelation 28, or excuse me, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Let's read that verse. There it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, it just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Now we not only have the in horrible environment, the weeping, the gnashing of teeth, the shame, the contempt, the fire and torment, but now we have the vile companions of all the murderers, adulterers, liars, uh, the homosexuals that have not repented, the embezzlers, the thieves. And now, on top of that, we get the devil and his angels. Uh, these are the types of people and beings that will be in hell along with us if we do not take care of it here on this earth. Hell is a place that has everlasting punishment as well. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 25, reading in verse 46. There it says, These shall go away in into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. One is life, one is punishment, but both last forever. As Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. After we die, we're going to be judged and sent to our eternal destiny. There's no second chances, as many people in some religions teach. Once again, that may sound good and sound like it's comforting, but that doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach anything about a second chance. That's a man-made doctrine. We're taught that after life, we go to the judgment. And after judgment, some will go into eternal life that lasts forever. And some will go into a punishment that lasts forever. It's described as everlasting. And therefore, this is a very, very serious, serious topic that we need to discuss. Hell is a place that is also separate and apart from the Lord and all of His blessings. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 again with me. We'll start reading in verse 7. There it says, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Well, can you imagine all the blessings that God gives us? It's hard to even number them all. Our life, our health, the sun, the earth, the air, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the companions and friends that we have, the family, the love, the jobs, the, it just goes on and on. Now imagine all those blessings being stripped away because you are away from the presence of the Lord. You are away from His glory. You are away from His power. He has separated you from Him forever. We don't have to go really any further because if you're not convinced that hell is a horrible place, there's really not much more scripture I can show you to describe uh, hell as, as horrible. I can't give you any more evidence than what I've already showed you in the scriptures. Hell is a horrible, horrible place that lasts forever and it's a real place, a place that we don't want to be a part of. So now it's important to ask the question, who will go to hell? Who's going there? If it's a real place that has all these vile companions, well, of course, we've seen the wicked. The wicked will go there. Those that rebel against God and do not wish to have Him in their life, they do not obey His laws, then they will be ones that end up in hell. In the book of Psalm, let's read chapter 9 and verse 17. There it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Well, those who sin and rebel against God and don't have those sins taken away and live a wicked life, they will be ones in hell. What about 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? That 
set of verses that we looked at earlier also gives us the description of who will be in hell. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 7 through 9. There, starting in verse 7, it says, To you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now notice this verse. Verse 8 says, In flaming fire taking vengeance. Okay, so if Jesus is going to return and take vengeance, who on whom will he take vengeance? There's two classes of people listed here. One, them that know not God. Those who did not look at the evidence of the life around them, the world around them, and seek out God to say, there must have been a creator, there must have been someone who created me, created this world, the universe. Romans chapter 1 lets us know that God has left us this earth and this universe as witness so that we would be without excuse to say there is no God. So we can look at the universe even without the Bible and understand there must have been a creator. And then we need to seek out who He is and know God as we looked at in one of our previous lessons about knowing God. So those that choose not to do that, those that choose not to know God, to seek Him out, they will be the first group of people that we see listed here in this verse. Let's look at the verse again. Not only those that know not God, but the second class or group of people that will be, receive vengeance from Jesus is those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those will be ones that have heard about Christ. Those, that'll be, those will be ones that have heard the gospel, heard the good news from the Word of God. This gospel message letting them know that yes, you have sinned. Yes, you deserve the death and the punishment away from God in hell. But Jesus Christ has come to earth to live a perfect life as a man, to be sacrificed on the cross, to pay that penalty for you so that you do not have to experience that death if you choose to accept the gift of Christ's sacrifice on your behalf. But some people will hear that gospel and they will say, I'm not going to obey. And therefore, they will be included in those upon whom Christ will take vengeance. And then verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Well, there you go. Those that do not seek out God and seek out the Creator and His will, or those who do hear about the gospel and do hear about God and do hear about His will, but choose not to obey it. So that logically leaves the answer to the question of how to avoid hell. We need to seek out God. We need to see God as the Creator. We need to seek His will. We need to read His Word. And then when we hear that gospel news of Christ, we need to obey it. And once we obey it, we need to continue to obey it for the rest of our life, living faithfully, serving Christ. Because there's another group of people who are going to hell, and it's those who have obeyed the gospel but choose later to leave Christ, to return back to the world. So we have the wicked, those who don't obey the gospel, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians. But now we have described in Scripture those who did obey the gospel. They received salvation. They received the opportunity to escape hell, but for whatever reason, they were too tempted of the things of the earth, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they went back into the world and abandoned their Christianity and abandon their salvation. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, because there it describes those who do that very thing. They have salvation, they have the knowledge of Christ, but then they choose to abandon it. Peter writes, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, do you see that? They, they were in the world, they were wicked, but they choose to find out about Christ and they, through their knowledge of Christ, are able to escape the pollutions of the world. But then what happens? They are again entangled therein and overcome. They are drawn back into the world and they are overcome back into the life of wickedness and sin. Well, Peter describes the rest of this verse as saying the latter end for those people is worse with them than the beginning. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It has happened, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. A disgusting picture. But this is what is described as those who would learn about Christ, choose to overcome the pollutions and the wickedness and the sin of the world, and yet be drawn back in to the world and its ways. And the Bible says their end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better had they just never obeyed the gospel in the first place than to obey it, to accept the salvation of the gift of Jesus on the cross and then to turn around and to spit upon Jesus and trample underfoot His sacrifice by going right back into the world. It's, the Bible says it would have been better if you just never obeyed the gospel in the first place than to do that. Imagine the horrible place that hell is and now imagine the, uh, the Bible describing it as you would have been better off not obeying the gospel. Well, as you can see, as we've learned through this lesson, I think we've already touched on the idea of how can a loving God send people to hell. Some people can't really understand how can some, a God who loves so much send people to hell. The truth is God loved us so much that He sent His only Son to die as a perfect sacrifice for you so you didn't have to go to hell. But some people on this earth will not choose to accept that sacrifice. Some will choose to continue to rebel and sin against God. And they say, I don't want you in my life, God. So therefore, when the day of judgment comes, God will say, your wish is granted. You don't want me in your life? You will now be separated from me for eternity. A loving God allowed you a way to escape hell. It's the individual choice that chooses to end up in hell. As we close, won't you study the word? Won't you believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess him before others and be baptized and then live faithfully. And you can avoid going to hell and instead have eternal life with him in heaven. If you would like to learn more about God's word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096 the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name. The name of victorious, of Jesus' sixth